Welcome to Salem the Podcast. We are your hosts and favorite Salem tour guides. My name is Sarah Black. And I'm Jeffrey Lilly. Today, we're going to be diving into Salem's shipping history. You know, like trade. You probably went out onto your porch this morning and picked up an Amazon box. And clicked free shipping. You have Amazon Prime. And you're like, I can get this in 24 hours. Damn it. Why isn't my thing here? Where is it? Those online trackers. Mm Mm-hmm. The, the FedEx app. The yeah, they didn't have that back then. No, <laughs> but but shipping, so when we talk about the history of shipping, just try to sort of relate it or understand it in today's modern world. Yeah, before you discredit it, remember that it is part of... Today, everyday life, right? Right. We're, we're having, uh, we're, we had during you know, the pandemic food shortages, supply chain issues, mm-hmm. whether that's trucking issues, whether that's shipping issues, whether that's port issues, or a little over a year ago, we all remember the the Evergreen fiasco oh, yeah. in the uh, Suez Canal. We all watched that ship <clears throat> tilted, yep. Every locked day. up. Every day. Oh, uh, up, update on the Evergreen. What is it? Yeah, but that's I don't remember the, the dollar count, but it was like billions oh, of yeah. dollars they were losing yeah. with every passing hour. It is, it's un. Uh, Almost unfathomable. They're talking numbers, and you're like, Haha, "You're just making this up." Like, what? It, what does that even mean on a global scale as well? It's not something we can really understand. But shipping history is just as important as modern day shipping, whether that's you know the Evergreen or your you know Amazon and, package, and especially to Salem in particular. So I think a lot of folks come here and they just think witches, witches. But remember, that's only you know 13 months. That's one year of our history within. A hundred years after 1692, by just the 1790s, Salem has cemented itself as an international seaport. People are traveling all over the world from this port to places like China, Indonesia, Russia. Right. Yeah, all up the, the Baltic Sea, down through the Mediterranean, uh, around Africa. The West Indies, bringing back spices, silks, any number of exotic Coffee, goods. Coffee, pepper, China, mm-hmm. uh, China from China, Chinese China. Yeah. Uh, but... As, as you mentioned, this is like, this is, this is Salem's history. And I would make the argument that the reason that we have such a strong narrative of the witchcraft trials mm-hmm. is because of our shipping history. Absolutely. So we have the trials that happens. That's important. That's incredibly important. But because the city props itself up and becomes a, uh, such a famous world city, such uh, having such an influx of money, of trade, of being on the world stage, they are then able to use that stage to then propagate the current narrative of the trials. And also make Salem what it is. What it is. Yeah. Right. If you walk down the streets of downtown Salem, especially those main drags like Essex Street, Derby Street, the waterfront district you're going to be surrounded by all these homes from you know the 1700s early 1800s these beautiful pieces of architecture are put up during this prosperous time in salem's history all all the money that's flowing in you're like oh wow look at these mansions well a they don't date back to the first period in the time of the witch house no they date back to this great age of sale, these merchants, these wealthy shipping captains, like I'm going to build these mansions, right? Today we got Bezos building his yacht. Mm -hmm. Back then (laughs) we, we got people in Salem building these mansions. Right. It's the same same thing. Same thing. Just, you know, a few centuries prior. Right. So a lot of the, like you said, a lot of the beautiful parts of Salem you see today are a direct result of this economic growth. It was ingrained in the city's identity from a very early time. Even if you look at the city motto, we've got, I can't say the Latin version. Oh, come but, on. But it's, oh, okay, yeah. <laughs> Report back to me when you can well, pronounce that correctly. When I've learned Latin? Yeah, yeah I'll, okay. I'll let you know. But um, translated, it is to the farthest port of the rich east. So that's that's the motto of Salem, is we're going to go, we're going to take our ships, and we're going to trade. And that's, I think, holds true e- even to today. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we have, uh, a lot of tourists that come from all over the world. We're not going to them. They're coming to us, mm-hmm. but actually I have, uh, given tours to, uh, international students, mm-hmm. uh, in Japan and in, in the center in, in, of the city in the fountain. Right. Um, right down on Essex street, right by the city fountain, right across from, uh, village tavern and the East India hall and that right. anchor. 
our thing, that anchor, which has been to Japan, there was a bit of a language barrier. Mm -hmm. That's fine. I think I might've mentioned this before, Mm -hmm. but Go ahead. You're it, like, it totally pertains. Right. You're like, here, look, this is our shipping. We used to come to you to trade your stuff from this city, and here we are today. So it, it all comes full circle. Well, if you didn't know, I bring people to the fountain yeah. there in town. That's one of our first stops on the Bewitch tour. And the archway you see where the water is coming out of, a lot of people think it's a gallows. They think that's where the witches were hanged. But it's actually a Chinese archway meant to represent those gates to the east. It's literally ingrained in our city's identity from the beginning. Yeah. And you say from the beginning, and, and those those narratives come from the late 1700s, but even as early as... Yeah, we got to back up. Like Yeah, like, <laughs> so we talked about Roger Conant. We talked, the, the indigenous people living here, this was a, a point of trade mm-hmm. uh, for them, even, right. even before it was a point of trade for us. Absolutely. And I mean, it's a, it's lush with fish. Yep. They were trading. Safe harbor. Yep. They like, were trading literally, cod the, before. The harbor is safe. Yep. Not like giving safe harbor. Oh. <laughs> I, just I, I understood what you yeah, meant. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, but, Salem then, itself, Salem Harbor, is a strategic settlement. Mm-hmm. So for this episode, it might be a good idea at some point to pull up a current map of Salem. So like just go on to your, your maps Google app. Maps hit Google Salem maps. maps. But then also we will be linking older maps in the show notes just to give you guys a sense of what it looked like when this Back great the day. yeah when this great age of sail was you know going on before the landfill right and before we'll talk about the that. shift in culture and these sorts of things but, but if, if you look at that map you'll see salem has this nice harbor nestled into the coastline there's this piece of land that jets out and makes out the southern east southeastern part of the harbor it's marblehead and then on top we've also got a little peninsula called winter island and quickly after establishing Salem, in like the 1630s, 1640s, you'll actually see two ports be placed. Two forts be placed on those peninsulas. Forts before the ports. Forts before the ports. For, for, forts to guard the ports. <laughs> well, c- forts to guard the ports. Yeah, I think we. Yeah, <laughs> it was a port. I mean, if you want to go technic- technicality, 19 or sorry, uh, technica- technically 1637. We'll see the first ship go out, but and uh, forts to ch- yeah, forts to protect the port. Say that five <laughs> times fast. <laughs> nope, I'm good. Uh, but if anyone's listening, you can you can try that for yourselves. Yeah. But 1637, what's on that ship? Salted cod fish. So again, the first big export we got here from Namgeg, the place of good fish, mm-hmm. from Roger Conant who is a cod uh, fisherman and a salter, we are now exporting cod. And they're not just exporting it like down to Boston. They're no. going all the way to the West Indies. Yeah. So international trade is going to start, or I should say transcontinental trade, is going to start within, within 11 years after Salem is founded. So that's literally like our, our history is rooted in the sea. It, it is shipping history. That is what gives Salem what it is today. And that history, or sorry, that that idea of shipping continues through the next, well, you know, few centuries. Uh, but there's not a big turning point again until the Revolutionary War. But through that time, Salem continues pretty much on par with everyone else uh, in this transatlantic trade. To start, you'll see a lot of logging. Furs. Um, furs, a lot of just natural resources being sent back to the crown across mm-hmm. the pond. Um, they'll start venturing into spices such as pepper uh, textiles tea ivory silks but to them one of the most important things was what today we'd call human trafficking or the import and export of enslaved peoples and salem's involved in the slave trade absolutely it is in 1638 that John Winthrop, and remember, we talked about him. He's the guy that comes to Salem. The Winthrop fleet, right after it's founded. Goes down to Boston because he's not too fond of Salem. He records in his journal seeing a ship come in called the Desire that came into Salem's port on February 26th. It had spent seven months touring the Caribbean. When it departed, it had several indigenous folks who had been enslaved during the Pequot Wars by the Puritans. Um, I hate like saying this stuff, but it must be said. They 
did not consider the indigenous as um, uh, easily trained. What, what's the phrase I'm looking for? They're harder to to get to work, to break, to break, I guess. Yeah, that's a good way to put it. So they would bring them down to Central America and trade for African individuals. So February 26th, 1638 is when we see the first recorded instance of African enslaved folks coming into the Massachusetts Bay Colony. And just three years later, Winthrop will take part in establishing the first North American law that condones slavery. So it's made legal. It's part of their narrative. It's part of their culture. It's part of how their society functions. Slavery, uh, some people like to say sort of uh, New England, Massachusetts is sort of dirty little secret. Um, we like to propagate ourselves as these big abolitionists and, you know, freedoms and all these good, positive things. But we were as heavily involved in the narratives as, as they were. Um, don't get me wrong. We, we do move away from mm-hmm. that. You know, we, we do see the errors of our ways uh, and we do codify these things into law long before the peoples in the South do. Um, but we were involved in the slave trade. Even up through the Revolutionary War, ships in Salem were being built to hold it Up out. until the Civil War. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Did I say Revolutionary yeah, War? Yeah, yeah. Even up until the Civil War, ships in Salem are being built to hold and house in, in enslaved peoples uh, and with the goal of human trafficking. Which is crazy because, like, you have this law that gets put in place in 1641 saying it's okay. Things go on for uh, roughly the next 140 years. By 1808, it is declared illegal, but it is still going on. You still see roughly a 1,000 enslaved folks being brought into the United States illegally, smuggling. Remember we talked about smuggling um, pretty much every year up until the Civil War, and there is evidence of those ships being outfitted here in Salem. Mm-hmm. So, And uh, one of the best records we have comes in 1754. We have... Uh, uh, ledger of the annals of Salem with uh, a direct count of how many enslaved peoples were in Salem. With a total of uh, 117. Quite a large amount. Yeah. For a, and that, that actually breaks that down size. into men, women, and children. And by comparison, Salem's total population was only like 21,000. By 1808, the importation of enslaved folks is declared illegal, but of course it still continues. And by 1820, participation in the foreign slave trade at all would be considered piracy and warrant the death penalty. Of course, this says nothing about owning slaves. They can still maintain their it's ownership. It's the, the import and export. Right. And what's actually interesting about that is that that, and we'll talk about this in shortly, but that as a timeline correlates with the decline of the sea trade here in, in Salem and the Massachusetts area. Oh yeah. Yeah. (laughs) So it's not even like we like to think of this as like a moral turning point, but in reality it is also just coinciding with the decline in shipping overall. Yeah. That's great to know. (laughs) Um, So we are in, involved in, in this through the, the 1700s. But then we get into the Revolutionary War. Massachusetts plays a major role in, obviously, the, uh, the birthplace of democracy. The Constitution was first read here. We all know about Paul Revere, the uh, American Revolutionaries, the Boston Tea Harbor, Boston Tea Harbor, excuse me, the uh, Boston Tea Party. Um, but Salem, I would say, plays a as big, if not bigger, role than any of those things. And may I say a cooler role? I think it's pretty neat. Yeah, no, personally. It's, yeah, it's, it's, it's really pretty, cool. It's kind of badass. So merchants, these merchants that have been trading all over the world are now enlisted to basically become legal pirates. So it's called privateering. Privateering. The Continental Congress uh, grants them letters of right. So it's basically saying on behalf of of the Continental Congress, you may go out and be pirate or commit acts of piracy. You can take British ships, merchant vessels, you can take them, take their people, take their goods, ransom them, sell them, do as you will. Bring it all back, sell the goods, get a bounty. And while while we're talking like large ship owners, we're also talking like 
fishing vessels. Yeah, it's not it doesn't have to be that big. No, um, it's, not it's, to jump ahead or anything, but there was also privateering in the War of eighteen twelve, and mm-hmm. if you come to Salem, mm-hmm. you can take a replica, like a, take a ride on a replica of one of those privateering ships. Yeah. We mentioned it in an earlier episode, but the Fame. Yes. It's not a big ship. No, it's like I mean, maybe not the size, like the size of a large truck, like a semi. No, like no, the no, length no, of no, a no, semi, no. like 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 a big Ford. No, two two no two, two trucks. It's definitely it's probably the length of a semi. I'd say. Oh no way! I think it's like I we could literally look up the size. But okay, we're, okay, <laughs> a large large truck. It's definitely yeah. you know it's compared to the Friendship, which we're going to mention in a mm-hmm. bit here. This big tall ship that docks outside of Derby Wharf the, the, currently. The Fame, this little schooner that the pi- privateers used in 1812, very very small. Yeah, but. They were agile. They could you know, dart around. They were motivated. Yeah, and like, and they wanted they wanted their stuff, and that that's they're pirates. Like let's be honest, that's the uh, U.S. government giving these people who own ship shippers merchants mm-hmm. permission to, to go and, and capture British ships, which is very very profitable. So when the Revolutionary War ends, uh, we enter what's commonly called in Salem the Great Age of Sail. So. Th- Think about it this way. You've got all these merchants. Their pockets are lined with monies and goods that they had acquired during the privateering. Right. They're like, I was a pirate. I took British stuff. I like this. I got money. How do I keep making more money? Yeah. And now you have this whole world to trade with. Up until that point, they were dealing with so many different restrictions from from Britain, uh, different trade restrictions. But now they can- Taxation. Taxation as well. No representation. Taxation. No representation. Yep. We all know this, but now they have the freedom. And to, as well as an identity. Yeah, exactly. We are now the United American States. American sailors. We're, we're American merchants. We right. are, and they're going to go brave the, the frontier of the, the ocean. Of the oceans. This great age of sail, we can't emphasize enough how significant of a moment in time this was for Salem's history. Like so, this is really the peak. So I, I, I got some numbers here. Um, in, in the early 1800s, so, so this is just a, a few years after this, in, in the height of the Great Age of Sail, mm-hmm. uh, the customs houses here in Salem are bringing in about $16, $17 million, which at that point was about 5%. Wait, 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 wait. $16, 17000000 million back then? Yeah, 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 yeah. Not in today's money. Not in today's money. That's insane. Back then, which was about 5% of the United States Gross, gross domestic, domestic product. Yeah. That's insane. Yeah. Salem was responsible for about 5% of the national budget. That's so crazy. Yeah. So I actually, I came across a really awesome quote in my research. It's from Samuel Elliott Morrison. He's a historian from the early 20th century. And in the maritime history of Massachusetts, he says, quote, the Boston was the Spain, Salem, the Portugal in the race for Oriental opulence. And. That's cool. I know, right? So uh, I think at this point, we're going to have to introduce uh, one of the forerunners of that, maybe the winner of that race. Yes, absolutely. Sure. I think it's perfect time. Yeah, he, he wins the race. Enter Elias Haskett Derby. He is commonly referred to as America's first millionaire. He makes his millions in the great age of sale in this shipping industry, uh, just like Jeff Bezos. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, I kind of like Derby more than oh, Jeff Bezos. Right? Yeah. Absolutely. Just, there's something more likable about a dead guy. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, and uh, he's responsible for the first, or that sends the first ship from America uh, to the ports of the Far East. Yeah. You may have actually come across his ship you, you've, a few times. I, I would, I like to say on my tour, like 100% of you have seen a picture of the Grand Turk and everyone starts sitting there like scratching their heads. There, I'm like, I promise, I promise you've all seen it on the old spice logo. So if you've used old spice, yeah, deodorant, shower gel, you got that cute little ship on the front. Mm -hmm. It's not cute. It's huge. And I mean, pretty awesome. Yeah. But yeah, that is his ship. The Grand Turk, the first ship to go to China sails there in 1784. And of course the, the name of old spices because he was dealing in the spice, spice trade, the spice trade there you which go. Is, is pretty clever. Extremely uh, clever. But he's the first. He's not the last. And a, 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 we're going to dedicate a whole episode to him. So uh, he plays a very major part in Salem's history and the Great Age of Sail, but he plays too large a part 
for us to talk about right now. Right now. So just understand Elias Haska Derby. Uh, he is one of the, the most important men in, in the community at that time when it comes to, to shipping the great age of sail. We're not trying to skip over his narrative. We're just going to give it its own spotlight, mm -hmm. but he sends the grand Turk to again, the city motto to the farthest ports port of the rich East. And that's sort of where these things derive from. Uh, and it's not just the rich East to be fair. They're up in the Baltic sea, Mediterranean mm -hmm. around the coast of Africa and they're everywhere. Yeah. They're literally everywhere. There's people. And I, I couldn't quite nail down where this quote came from or where the image came from. Uh, I guess there were people who thought that Salem must be this great country. That's so cool. Because there were so many ships. Like the reputation was so significant. Yeah. All the boxes, all the merchants, all the ships. They're like, Salem must be this huge, great place. Um, there were maps that were drawn that show Salem like, like, this like large in comparison to its actual like the size of a state oh i love it right you're like whoa salem they, they didn't get <laughs> like yeah this tiny little coastline is responsible for all these ships all over the world we are making a huge impression uh for decades uh, across the world as this great forerunner of of seafaring mercantile and, and, and shipping industry even if you look at our city seal, like it's it's not a pilgrim. It's nope. not a witch. Massachusetts is a pilgrim, right? I, I believe, believe so. Yeah. Yes. But and, and Salem, Salem, just another thing you would think they'd slap a witch on, but uh, it was actually established. That seal was established during the peak of this trade. Uh -huh. And if you look on it, a, a proper reproduction, you'll see this, uh, this robed man. He's got slippers on, a turban as well. And around him, he's, he's surrounded by palm trees. And what there's I believe, ship. there's a ship in the background, of course. And uh, it's, he's surrounded by palm trees and, I believe, pepper plants. Sure. Jeff thinks it's coffee. I think it's coffee. We had this huge debate before we started recording. <laughs> so I, at some point in, in my uh, history education, I was told that it, it was it was coffee. So uh, then we looked up both. And I, I've seen coffee plants. I think it looks more like a coffee plant. It could very well be a pepper plant. It was designed around pepper. It was, pepper was it important. Was, it was designed by a pepper merchant. So I, I... I just think it looks a little more like coffee. That's all. Anyways. But, but yeah, not a witch, <laughs> not a pilgrim. It's it's a it's a Sumatran merchant. Mm -hmm. It's not even like the, the background isn't even Salem. No, it the, it the, is the, the Far East. It is the Far East where these people would have been seeing all these ships. I also think what's pretty cool is these journeys weren't like one and done, right? Mm -hmm. They weren't like a ship went from Salem to this port and back to Salem. They right. would spend months if not sometimes years uh with this intercoastal trading around africa india and then indonesia and china so they would go with like an amount of ships and sometimes the contents of a ship would be changed over three or four times so you're not just doing like and i'm just gonna make up numbers okay cool this stuff is worth a hundred dollars you go and you trade it cool you got your hundred dollars you go back you trade it for other stuff, you get $100. You trade that for stuff, you get another $100. So by the time they've come back, they've gone through several times. Mm -hmm. And they're coming back with money on top of it. They're coming back with money, with goods. Uh, you know, back to your original point at the beginning, or a little anecdote about Mr. Bezos and how you can, like, download an app and track your stuff. Yeah, yeah. Like, back then, you would send a ship out. Oh, it would just be... And it would be months, years before it ever comes back. You just got to hope that mm -hmm. it makes it. You got to hope that it's not being captured at by some pirates. point by pirates. Yeah. Or lost in a I, shipwreck. Like, yeah. you know, they just kind of had to trust that. I'm sure there was there was a margin of error. There, and but. one thing that was kind of cool is, you know, telecommunications is totally the wrong word. Other ships would obviously encounter other ships. Oh, yeah. So when a ship got back, they would be, they would, as an example, they'd be, oh yeah. We ran into so-and-so yeah. in this port, so-and-so. Six months ago. Yeah, okay. So you, there was a bit of chain of communication. But that still would have been like, oh yeah, the last time the grant, the last time I, as the owner of the ship, got word of the ship was, you know, a few weeks ago from these people who saw the ship six months ago. That's still. Talk about having to relinquish. Um, Control. Yeah. 
Big yeah, time. Right? You there's no navigation, there's mm-hmm. no GPS, there's no texting. You have no you're just like, mm-hmm. here you go. I'm going to put $1000 worth of my goods on this ship and hope that in 2 years time they come back with $10,000 worth of stuff. And go forth. What? Go forth. Go go forth. But they did. They they brought back loads of stuff. Uh, they brought back goods. They also brought back, which we'll talk about in a minute. But one thing that I like is they brought back stuff. St- like, and stuff. by stuff we mean like a Ch- huge array of treasures, things. artifacts. Sometimes uh, they'd be referred to as like cur- we might refer to them today as like curios. But um, I think like cabinet of curiosities, yeah, yeah. those kind of things. Um, and this is one of the reasons that the East India Company was founded. It was these merchants bringing back their stuff. So they knew what they were doing. They knew they were traveling the world and seeing sights and things that many other people would never get the chance to see. Seeing things that they had never had seen never before seen. in yeah. their lives. And they brought back these artifacts, the, the, these cool goods. It actually inspires Hawthorne to write a story mm-hmm. about this as well. But... uh this was their collection. That's what the East India Company was. If East India Company sounds familiar, it's because if you are at that fountain that we were just describing and you a couple minutes anchor. ago, and if you look across from which city mall, you're going to be staring at the Peabody Essex Museum. This is the first like iteration iteration of the Peabody Essex yeah. is the East India Marine Hall. And it still bodes that title Mm -hmm. on the building itself in today. They'd bring back clothes, weapons, trinkets. Uh, I've heard there's shrunken heads that are in the basement. Ooh, I hope they pull those out one day. Um, But of course, getting back, and I know I've mentioned this before, my favorite thing (laughs) is the penguin. Yeah, you you were mentioning before we hopped on here uh, that they used to parade. They'd have parades in the street. Yeah, they'd have an annual sort of... and. I only saw some references to this, Mm -hmm. so maybe in my mind it's sort of more grandiose than it was, Mm -hmm. but I'm thinking like musicians and like a bandstand and these ship, these sailors wander, here's this robe, (laughs) here's this sword, here are these shrunken heads, and then the dude walking through the street with this stuffed penguin, (laughs) inaccurately taxidermy (laughs) penguin. I, I, A sight to be seen for sure. Yeah. But that's that was Salem, yeah. and of course, all these people. That was Salem, and that is they, Salem today. They still. were so rich; they could buy whatever they wanted, right? They could buy oil prints and, and buildings and all these things. But these treasures, oil prints? you mean paintings? Oil paintings. Oh my god! Sorry, <laughs> <laughs> oil paintings, prints, artistry. Their houses were like gilded, but these treasures, and again, this is just sort of how I interpret it, were unique. Right? right? These were. These were something special. These are things that they can't make here. Yeah. You can't, you know, Samuel McIntyre could build, design, and carve your whole house. But but I got this stuffed penguin back. <laughs> right? <laughs> or like a jewel or a, yeah. 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 So that was the cool stuff. Right. Which is pretty neat. The cool kids club. Yeah. No, no it was. Definitely. It was unequivocally the cool kids club. It reminds me of um, that movie, The Lost City of Z. When I think of like ex- yeah, the Lost City of Z, I think, I the, I'm not with um, Brad Pitt, where he's like he's he's uh, it's based on a true story. He's this famous explorer. Actually, it's not Brad Pitt. It's the guy who plays in Sons of Anarchy, Charlie Hunnam. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, he goes to like South America, and he is like trudging through the jungle, and he meets all these different you know indigenous tribes. He makes several trips back and forth. He eventually goes missing with his son convinced that there is this big city of gold called Mm -hmm. the lost city of Z. And uh, I just, that whole feeling of like exploration Mm -hmm. and the unknown. And this is also when we're getting like these developments in biology and science in general. It's a very, it'd be a very interesting time. Oh, I can't, I, it's weird. This is like, I know what was going on, but when you try and put yourself in the mindset of these people, it, how fascinating mm-hmm. it must have been to see this stuffed penguin or an actual elephant. Oh, yeah. We talked about the elephant, too. Yeah. The first ele- yeah, the first elephant came through Salem during this time as well. Yeah. Yeah, these, uh, just think, these exotic goods, animals, but, people. But all these people, but all these things, not 
enslaved people. Sorry. No, no, no. I mean, like, we mean like merchants. Merchants. Right, from, right, right. They, they, would, they would hire people from these ports. Like, as de- So, and this is a little bit of a tragedy. Uh, you hit a bad storm. You, you get uh, diseases on your ship. You might need to hire new deckhands uh, in some of these ports. Right. And they're going to stay with you sometimes for years doing these travels. So they've, they're from who knows where uh, in, in these ports of, of, of Africa or China or whatnot. And they come back here and now they land they're in hel- the port of Salem. Yeah. And Salem Harbor. Salem Harbor with the hundreds of wharves, uh, with all the, the, the spice and the sound and the noise. I, I've read reports of, of these, these deck hands with monkeys and parrots and turbans and robes. And you're like, God, that, that, that must have been so cool. So cool. And you got to remember, these people don't have the internet. They don't have pictures, no. yeah. really. They, they they had drawings, but, you know, few and far between. This is something incredibly unique and new to them. Yeah. And, of course, on top of all of this, while there's all this cool stuff, don't, get, don't forget, it's still all for profit. Oh, all yeah. for money. And one of the most important imports is... Uh, on your kitchen table, probably. Hopefully. <laughs> I would think. Right? I, I, some people might be... I put pepper over salt any day. Hmm. Pepper over salt. Depends on... No, I, I put pepper I put pepper on pretty much everything I eat. Yep, same. Yeah. But that's probably the number one import in to Salem. Uh, Definitely brings quite a bit of that wealth yeah. in with it. And pepper is not really... You know, it's not a new hot commodity. It's value was so high throughout history that it was oftentimes used as a type of current currency. And I even read that it was rumored Attila the Hun requests, remember the guy that's in charge of the Huns, requested over a ton worth of pepper to stop attacking Rome back in the 5th century. Man, who would have thought Elias Aska Derby and Attila the Hun had something <laughs> in common. They both dealt in pepper. <laughs> but that that idea of pepper... Right, uh, is so incredibly valuable that you're bringing crates and crates, and this is where uh, Derby makes his millions. Right, off of this black gold. It was so precious. It was so valuable at points that it was worth more than gold and silver and precious metals like that. So they literally called it black gold. And now we just are like, yeah, cool. Yeah, so next time you crack open your pepper. He's like, I'm just going to put this on my salad, on my chicken. I'm cooking a steak. Uh, you know, I know people put it on pizza. Is it peppers? Yeah, put it on everything. Right? But that's that's where Derby's making his money. That's where Salem is making his money. That's where these people are getting all of their wealth. And I, unless... The markup is insane. It, yeah, it's probably several hundred percent uh, markup. So today you, you go to the store, you buy a little pepper grinder for like, you know, three, four bucks. Mm-hmm. Imagine paying 10 times that for, uh, for, for that amount. For spice. Yeah. But you have to know that it's not seen as just like a table condiment back then, but a sign of luxury, of status. A little high end. Yeah. It's kind of like what people would show off with if they had people over. If you had pepper to spice the food with, well, oh my goodness. You must have some extra cash laying around. Exactly. Exactly. And of course, they had a bland, a pretty bland diet. So for flavoring purposes. Believe it or not, saffron was anywhere from 10 to 100 times more expensive. I, I think so. it still is. Is it? Oh, yeah, because it, it, you usually get it in the teeny tiny like, little jars, right? Yeah, yeah. It, don't quote me on this, but I think it's like one of the most expensive spices. spices that you yeah. can still purchase. Well, it still holds up today. Now, I said that pepper was pretty pricey throughout history, but this is actually like the tail end of its height of the spice market that sort of makes sense with all the you know flood of availability right right then it's gonna you know that's gonna affect the market value absolutely i actually read that the dutch had reportedly burnt or dumped cargoes of pepper to maintain high prices which just like blew my mind i mean like i don't know like you, corporate greed, right? We yeah. still have, you know, these Yeah, it's companies. very reminiscent of like <laughs> we, we're current practices. Huge inflation going on at the moment. We know that there is an abundance of product and they're just jacking up the prices. But if at the same time you're like, oh, this crate of pepper is, I'm just, I'm just making stuff up like a yeah. hundred dollars. And then you're like, well, we lost a whole ship and everyone's going to be like, oh. 
Wasn't there like a, I was recently told of a whiskey, I think, that was super coveted. And I think it's a whiskey or a bourbon. And like, uh, we're talking thousands of dollars for a bottle. And one of the shipments, like they're very small batches, went missing. And it was supposed to, supposedly a heist. Once that happened, the prices went up even more. And some people blamed the owner and were like, you know, well, maybe they orchestrated a this little suspicious, to yeah. generate the press. And well, maybe, maybe that's what Derby did. That's how he got all, although he wasn't Dutch, but, you know, still. He was hiding all his product in the tunnels. Yeah. <laughs> Stop propagating false narratives. We'll be talking about that soon. Yeah, all, all of worry. his uh, his illicit tunnels with his prostitutes and opium and whiskey and none of that. All the fun parts of Salem. Right, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, what's your favorite thing to do on a Friday night? And you're like, well, <laughs> let me tell you about the tunnels and the parties. <laughs> parties and the tunnels. Tunnel parties. Yeah. That's so funny. That's <laughs> so funny. Uh, that, that's where all the pepper was. Maybe there's still some down there. Oh, you've heard that? No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Real question. <laughs> I can't do <laughs> is, is the pepper haunted? Is this... <laughs> <laughs> That's really funny. Ha- right, what's better than haunted pepper? Haunted Salem pepper. <laughs> oh, my God. That's so good. <laughs> anyway. So the market value of pepper was uh, being manipulated by the uh, owners of the company who were yeah. bringing it in. But still significantly higher than what you see in the store today, yeah. of course. Still a sign of opulence, but certainly coming down from its, its high time. The last ship to carry pepper in a Salem arrived in 1846, and its reputation with the spice had grown so much that nearly 100 years later, by the mid-20th century, people in Australia were still referring to the whole pepper, peppercorns as, quote, Salem pepper. Where did that go? Why can't I just we, found fascinating. Why can't we still have that? Can we make that a thing? Just stop calling it pepper and just, just start just, calling it Salem like, pepper. Like you go, the, oh, do you have any peppercorns? Do you have any Salem pepper? I love it. <laughs> right? Love it. Okay, so that's that's everyone's homework is to reestablish Salem pepper. Uh, Salem pepper. We can do it. We can make it happen. But this prosperity isn't going to last forever. Nothing lasts forever. As prosperous as Salem was, unfortunately, there's more global issues at foot. We have. The Napoleonic Wars between England and France. And then in 1812, we have our own conflict with the English again, the War of 1812. And that also includes the French. And because global trade is such a significant part of the global economy right now, you're going to see that conflict spill into the waters. So in 1806, Congress passes the Non-Importation Act, which will go into effect the following year, basically saying that the U.S. cannot import export goods that they can get here. So you're not importing, you know, furs and logging and these sorts of things. We have those up in Maine. Or even goods like furniture and yeah, whatnot, yeah. textiles. Um, and then in February of 1807, so this is you know less than a year later, there is a significant British attack on an American ship known as the Chesapeake. The U.S. kind of freaks out. The American people are pissed. Yeah. They want a response. But Thomas Jefferson doesn't really want to go to war, so he puts in place this embargo of 1807, and him and Congress. It wasn't just him. And... It is devastating to the economy. That any most trade embargoes are, you know, can have a, a significant repercussion, mm-hmm. and especially when a city like Salem relies, at that point, I would say exclusively on on sea trade. When you have all these wealthy merchants, they're bringing in all this stuff, all this pepper, and now that's that's cut off. They're they're seeing their pockets dry up a little. Yep. Enter the War of 1812. Now, this is one that we couldn't really stay out of. Uh, This is when we actually declare war on Britain, but it further impedes trade. Sailors are being attacked. We get back into uh, privateering. Yep, that brings back privateering. So you will see some folks trying to keep their pocketbooks stable by going out and engaging in that legal piracy again. Which makes sense, right? Yeah. It's the only way to keep it going. But also, if... 
what's easier? You're like, that British ship has already done all the work for me. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Instead of having to go all the way down around Africa, I'm just going to go take t- that. I'm just going <laughs> to take their stuff real quick. And uh, I mean, I guess that's the that's the goal of piracy, mm-hmm. right? Or any theft, you know, is you're going to take someone else's goods. Right. Um, but we see after that uh, a continued decline in the seafaring trade, especially here in Salem. As we talked before, that uh, annexation of the ability to transport uh, enslaved peoples, that adds into it. But one of the largest issues becomes the size of ships. Right. So think about Boston. Huge. It's still an international port. New York, L.A., Right, you, you've, We talked about the Evergreen in the beginning yeah. of the episode. The size, the scope of these ships. Those aren't going to fit in a Salem Harbor. Yeah. If you've been to Salem, you know this. If you haven't, take a look. Just Google Salem Harbor. Um, it's nice. It's quaint in the summer. It it's, works for the late 1700s. Yeah, full of small sail ships. Uh, but but as these wars are going on and ships, you know, innovate war spurs innovation, you've got larger and larger ships. And those outgrow. vessels are just not going to be... Salem's Harbor can't handle it. Compatible with Salem's Harbor. Boston and, like we said, New York, just much more fitting. Yeah, these these big deep water harbors is is where uh, these big, larger vessels end up going. And that just sort of slowly takes hold. And over the next several decades, uh, Salem just, I guess, naturally takes the course of shipping to textiles. And we open mills and these sorts of things. And its position as this international trade partner kind of just dissolves. But we still have wealth. Uh, we still have some power. All the buildings are here. They're mm-hmm. still here. You can look at all these these wealthy shipping. They, they, they still have homes here. They're still making money. No, we also still have. What's that? The practical navigator. <laughs> so Salem's uh, imprint on sea trade I would, I would, I would make and the just like maritime, maritime history, but even modern sea trade. Right. I, I would argue that uh, it's never gone away; that we still have a lasting impression on the desks of many a ship captain today. <laughs> uh, a little book called "The Practical Navigator" by uh, Bowditch or Nathaniel Bowditch, one of the most famous people to come out of Salem. Uh, he's up there with with Hawthorne, with McIntyre. With Derby. With Derby, yeah. He's incredibly intelligent. A uh, man speaks you know, multiple languages, he's sort of a math genius, science genius, and he comes out with this book of navigation charts, shorelines. Uh, uh, maps. E- maps, uh, e- equations, and, and whatnot for traversing the seas. And... Uh, this gives us in the great age of sail another little bit of clout mm-hmm. because this is a a very uh, popular, widely received book, but it's scientifically accurate. So not only is like the ship captains like, wow, look at this. The scientific community mm-hmm. is like, wow, look at this. Right. So that sort of doubles onto that and it is still in use today. Um, yeah, it didn't go outdated. No, you it's, know, it's it's literally still used uh, as far as I'm aware all, and this is what I've been told, uh, so if someone uh, knows otherwise, all U.S. naval ships, even to this day, carry a copy of Bowditch's The Practical Navigator. Maybe all ships could should do that. Hey, you know, if the Evergreen had had a copy of <laughs> Bowditch's Navigator, they wouldn't have gotten stuck in the Suez Canal. Touche. So uh, that brings us to today and what we still have of uh, Salem's Great Age of Sail. Yeah, I feel like it's not, I like to say it's not really history. It is still here. Yeah. Like Salem's Harbor is still here. Yeah. Derby Wharf is still here. We have a Derby. tall ship docked. I'd say, I was about to say 24-7, but it was missing for several years, getting work done <laughs> on it. Uh, the town was very resentful towards that. But, uh, you know, you walk down Derby Street, the, the main drag of our seaport area, and it is almost like walking back in time. Yeah, and what I think a lot of people house. You've got don't the, realize mm-hmm. is that they're walking into a national park. It is, or a national historic site. And, right. and we've talked about this already a couple of times. But this uh, opens in 1938, which makes it the oldest national historic site. And it encompasses, what, about nine acres, 12 buildings, 
all of Derby Wharf and all of this is in uh, historical accuracy to Salem's Great Age of Sail and how that impacted uh, the United States. You can also check out what remains of Salem's customs houses. So, Mm -hmm. of course, these are the buildings that merchants would stop in to, like, pay taxes. Um, There's also, you know, beds in there if they need to stay for an extended period, uh, warehouses attached and whatnot. The one, I think, more prominent one and the one that's actually part of this National Historic Site is right on Derby Street, sits right across from Derby Wharf, and it's this beautiful building with these huge columns, a big eagle on the top, and if you go in, it's a museum, and I believe it's still free. You'll see kind of what, uh, it'll give you a good glimpse into what this age of sale really did look yeah. like. And I always find that building to be beautiful, right? Yes. Like you go in, you're like, oh my God, this is so nice. Not everyone thought that. Uh, specifically, uh, Mr. Nathaniel Hawthorne. Uh, <laughs> he worked there. And he's a little resentful he, towards it. He, he, I would say he hated it. He, he writes about it, uh, his time there and relates his time there. Uh, and transcribes that into some of his later stories. And he really sort of depicts it as this horrible, dreadful cobweb. <laughs> he's like, like he's working in the basement and everyone hates him. And I always love reading his interpretation of that work there because it's very similar to how a lot of people describe hating their jobs today. Indeed. Like, oh, I have to go and my commute and work is horrible. And, and you really see this. But when then you go and you see the customs house, you're like, dude, I would love to work here. This building's gorgeous. Yeah. So we've all heard of the Scarlet Letter before. Like yeah, probably had to read it in, in high school. So that those images that he described come from his time. And if you check out the museum, they actually have some of his notes and one of his walking sticks yeah. in there. It's very, very cool to see. And then the other customs house kind of flies under the radar right off of Essex Street. It's hidden. Not not really. Not really, but like it's unless you're looking for it. So one thing that I think makes it a little harder to find is it's not on the current waterfront. Ah, yes. So it's the 1805 Customs House. It's right on Central Street, uh, which is right on Essex Street. So it's right at the corner of Central and Essex. Big building. You can see right out front the sign says customs house and i promise you it says customs house i know it looks like an f that's just what a lowercase s was yeah, back it's called in the a day long s so it's literally like if you take the two bits of an s and you pull it mm-hmm. so it's like like you're stretching taffy mm-hmm. right and, then, and there you go and that's that's what you knew yeah. that sound again <laughs> that's a long s but it says 1805 customs house because in 1805 the water was pretty much right there pretty much there yeah so once again we're going to link you some of those maps in the show mm-hmm. notes because Salem's coastline looks quite a bit different than it does in modern day. Yeah. We did bring in quite a bit of uh, granite yeah. to fill in the land there. So when we have Front Street, just right in downtown, it's right off Derby Square, right by the Customs House, that would have been the water Waterfront. front. So the Customs House, 1805, would have been there. We build the newer one on the uh, National Park, and that's the one that you can go see that uh, Hawthorne worked at. Down by the wharf, you will also see a West India goods store, Mm -hmm. as well as this kind of large plain structure out on the wharf. It's called the Pedrick Storehouse. I read that that's actually where a lot of the work on the friendship is done. That's that's really what it's mainly I've seen inside. There's a lot of uh, rope hanging and sails folded. Yeah, so that's probably where they're hiding the rest of the friendship. (laughs) Put it back together. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> I'm not sure that so I know there's probably a reason for, for it for those like, of you who are unaware of the the grievance at the moment there's a replica of a ship called the friendship originally built in the 1790s the, gorgeous the, ship the, the original ship the original ship yeah yeah so let's talk about that a little bit all right I am not a ship person so I'm gonna pull this straight from the National Parks website the original friendship was a two decked three masted square rigged 342 ton vessel that sounds cool i don't know what that means it reminds me of a car right yeah i mean it's basically their their water cars yeah yeah (laughs) yeah what you got in there what you got in that garage right (laughs) (laughs) um but that that was the original friendship right which is gone yeah if you come to salem harbor you'll see it docked the replica the replica docked at derby wharf pretty much 24 7 
the grievances. It was missing. For, so, uh, missing. I guess. <laughs> so I guess there's a grant uh, for the, this replica ship, and I guess every so often you have to clean it and, and dry dock it, and these sort of things. And it had gone too long, so then it was out of the water for too long, and they bring it back, and it's been there for about. They've brought it back two, three years now. Yeah, it was away from the harbor for I think. For two or three two or three years it's been back for for two or three three years and we still don't have the top mast yeah so the the top two-thirds of each of the masts are uh just at rest on the ground next to it um i'm sure there is some reason we had covid we had these sorts actually speaking of covid this was pretty cool i don't know if you ever saw this uh, during the height of the pandemic and when everyone was in lockdown and quarantine, mm-hmm. there was a flag that's flown. Oh, yep. I know what you're going to say. On, yeah. On the grounds of the National Park next to the Friendship. And it was a yellow flag. Which stands for quarantine. Which, stands, which is what a ship would fly if they had to quarantine out in the water if there was some disease aboard the ship, which I thought was really cool. Tip of the hat to history. Yeah, I love like, it. Like, thank you, National Park Service. I even even when no one's around, even when we're uh, in the height of this, I, I thought that was a little fun little tidbit. No, definitely. So the original friendship yeah. has has been lost. Lost? Like, is it some sunken treasure somewhere? So for the longest time, <laughs> if only you could go dive with it. Oh, I would do that in a second. I know. Uh, for the longest time, I thought. The friendship in Salem was very much like the Constitution in Boston. Like where the original. It's, yeah, it's like the yeah. original. Like in, in place, things have been replaced over time, but it is the original yeah, ship. I mean, that's... I don't know if I can handle this right now. <laughs> do you want to do it? I don't know I, if I we're going to have time to sneak it in. <laughs> I'll, I'll say it and you can come down if you want. Okay. Well, as parts of a ship are replaced, as I'm sure uh, some of you are familiar with that... Uh, you know, philosophical idea or question of the ship of Theseus, uh, which for those of you who don't know is sort of an idea. It's, you know, in these ancient Greek, I believe it was Plato, um, who says, if you have a, th- a ship and we're going to call it the, the, the ship of Theseus and it's in, in dock. And over the years, the ship is slowly replaced as bits of the wood rot and need to be replaced. And at some point, if every piece of the ship is replaced, is it still Theseus's ship? Um, and then later on, uh, and I believe Hobbes and Locke also address this question, uh, what if then that all the pieces that were rotted are kept to the side? And then at some point we come up with a technology to fix those, not replace them, but just mm-hmm. now the rod is gone and you rebuild the ship of Theseus with those pieces that were replaced. So now I you have, have two ships. which one is the ship of Theseus? And there's, there's a lot of, philosophical questions that come along with this um but the constitution is mostly yeah i had a friend back in college who like knew that thing up and down and she could tell you what percentage of the ship was still original yeah um but for the longest time that's what i thought was the case with the friendship friendship. you know it was like a brilliant replica yeah it's beautiful no but upon this research i found out what really happened to the friendship and it's kind of funny not funny for them, but in retrospect, <laughs> I mean, uh, so basically the friendship set sail for its, I believe, 12th voyage. Uh-huh. They're over in Russia. They're doing their trading thing. War of 1812 starts. They don't know. Because again, there's no way to keep in touch yeah, with. No cell phones. Yeah. Like, no, what's the beep thing? Beep, beep, Morse code? Yeah. No Morse code yet. Like, they have no idea. So they start sailing back to Salem get captured in the Atlantic by the British and get taken as a prize of war, basically. Can you imagine like being one of those sailors? And they don't know. And they see a British vessel. They're like, hey guys. Yeah. And they're like, hey guys, what you oh hey, sorry, we're at war. Yeah. Uh you're you're gonna have to come with us. Hilarious. I'd be like, see that's why it's funny in retrospect. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Because we know the war is going on. They didn't. Yeah. Um so the the thankfully the captain and the crewmen they are sent. They're safe. They, they're, they're safe. Okay. They're not like, you know, tortured or anything. They are allowed to return back to Salem and the friendship is auctioned off in London, actually. And and then goes goes to time. No one really knows what happens from there on out, but 
I'm yeah. shocked. I know. I thought no, for the like, longest like, time it was. Someone's got to have a record of it. I would, I think there's a record of probably who it was sold to. But yeah, at no. that point, think about. Did they just dismantle it? Is it just gone? Is it sunk? There's, I don't know. Sank? March of 1813. That's crazy. From what I read, that was like the last report. And that's report. it. Man, I'd be curious. If, if someone out there knows what happened to the friendship. Ooh, another fun connection too. The original friendship was constructed in Salem, registered for the first time at the Salem Customs House to merchants Aaron Waite and Jareth Meal Pierce. So if that sounds familiar... Waite and Pierce. You've, you've probably taken a stroll down Derby Street. There's a little storehouse on the right-hand side if you're coming up to the harbor, yep. and it's called Waite and Pierce. And they sell all sorts of uh, nautical uh, maps, booklets, seafaring. It's I think I believe it's ran or leased by the National Park. Yes. Uh, the built, yeah. So they have all that that cool National Park stuff in there as well. And you can also if you're looking for something more rugged, you can go visit the forts on Marblehead and Winter Island. Mm. Those still, I mean it's just remnants, yeah. ruins basically, but that in particular will kind of give you a sense of the view when you're looking out at this vast sea like Picture yourself back then. This is what they would have seen. Ship after ship coming in. Or, or, or you could go take a tour. On the fame. On the fame. Yeah. I love the fame. That's like one of your favorite things to do, it right? It is, still. Yeah. I've been here for several years, but I do it every year. And and he's well-versed in the history of the fame and the War of 1812. So if you're looking, if you're, if you're like, oh, this is cool, go go do that. Yeah, remember, it's that, that's... The little schooner, the replica from the War of 1812. They got a little cannon on the boat that they shoot <laughs> off. It's so cool. Yeah. So if you want. We should get a cannon sound. Ooh, that's a good idea. It might be like the first sound to save. Yeah, right? Yeah. That's good. We got boom. We do like a witch's cackle as well. Oh, I like that. Yeah. Okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I think that wraps up our little talk of uh, Salem's great age of sale. Yeah, we're hoping that it wasn't boring i know i i know trade in general i think when you hear that word it kind of you're like oh gosh but then again we all loved watching the uh the evergreen get stuck and we all care where our amazon packages are so this still matters still matters right so that's gonna bring us to a close thanks for listening uh, before we go, just wanted to remind you that we will be dropping a bonus Q&A episode this coming Sunday. So just in a few days, we'll be recording on Saturday. So if you have not submitted a question, please do so. You can email us, contact us on the socials, and we've got a contact form directly on our website. In our next episode, we are going to be bringing you our second interview with... Nope, nope. Don't tell them. Oh. Keep it a secret. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Just, can we at least give them a hint? We can get okay. Uh, so what we're doing is we're tying in who we're interviewing to this past episode we just talked about. So they're experts, sure, on uh, connoisseurs, connoisseurs on uh, some products that would have been brought into Salem during the Great Age of Sale. Be sure to subscribe, leave a review, and go tell three of your friends. Follow us on the socials, Instagram, Facebook, and TikTok. If you have any questions, as always, but more specifically, because we are doing the bonus episode, uh, feel free to email us at hello at salemthepodcast.com. And remember, if you're visiting Salem and you would like to take a tour with either Jeffrey or myself, links to both of those companies are in the show notes. Thanks for listening. See you later. Mm-hmm.